hello, and welcome once again to the Citanium Mine. In case you're wondering, yes, it is indeed cold down here. It's a mine, and it's February. What did you expect? And so, once again, we have come to that time where I need to run down every game that I played released in 2022, from best to worst. But a few notes before we continue. A. No, I did not play Elden Ring or God of War Ragnarok. That is why they are not on the list. Maybe one day I will, but not at present. B. I played several demos, which uh, won't appear on this list because they were, well, demos. Uh, however, I did want to shout out a few impressive ones that I'm hoping to play full versions of in the future, hopefully the near future. Uh, those games are Potionomics, Dredge, and Forever Skies. Uh, if I do get to play the full games, I will do a full Citanium Mine episode on those afterward. And see, in the interest of not wasting everybody's time, there were actually many games in 2022 that I uh, did not play enough to give thoughts or opinions on them, so I omitted them from the list. Uh, those entries include... <clears throat> Pentiment, Umarangi Generation Special, Moon Scars, Spelunky 2, Loot River, Space Punks, Gloomhaven, The Unliving, RoboQuest, TMNT Shredder's Revenge, Citizen Sleeper, Despot's Game, Soccer Story, Windjammers 2, Power Wash Simulator, Research and Destroy, Wildcat Gun Machine, and Ghost Lore. Out of those, Pentiment is the one title I will be getting back to. I just have to be in the correct mindset to play that kind of game. And with all that said, let us finally get on to every game I played from 2022, ranked best to worst. Let's start things off right. The number one game, the bestest best game that I played all year. Okay, it's Vampire Survivors. I'm I'm sorry, folks, but it, it it's Vampire Survivors. I have to I have to do it. You know the thing about Vampire Survivors that's so insidious is that they come up with this really simple concept, right? Like all you do is move around a map, and it it's pixelated, and it's a survival game, and you think to yourself that this seems rudimentary and simple. And then you unlock all of these new abilities, and then you start getting waves of new enemies that come across the screen, and you start leveling up, and you start seeing that you can take different abilities and put them together in new and unique ways, and some of them combine and become like super weapons and abilities that make you much more powerful. And in this 30 minute time frame that you are given in order to survive, you go from being this weakling pleb all the way up to this hopefully all-powerful being that can just squash all the hordes as they come towards you. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't get the right build. And then what are you going to do? You're falling behind, and the enemies are getting more powerful than you're able to build up power. And now you got to think about how you're going to deal with that situation. And then you get to the end of one run, and lo and behold... You've unlocked a bunch of new things. Now you have new maps and you have new modes that you can get into. And, and the whole thing is just set up to be this endlessly replayable game that constantly unlocks new and interesting things for you to play around with. And it never takes itself seriously. It just tries to do the basic thing that it does as well as it possibly can and keep reiterating on it. And the results are terrific. It's the kind of game that you will go back and play periodically forever. The number two game on my list, though, was actually at the top of my list before Vampire Survivors came along, and that's Nobody Saves the World. Uh, I give Nobody Saves the World a lot of props, mostly for its innovation. So Drinkbox Games created this almost Zelda-like adventure with a really nice art style and a quirky personality, but with the conceit that you keep unlocking new forms that you can turn into. And this allows you to get into new areas of the map and unlock new abilities. So you become a rat, and then you can get into very, very small crawl spaces. You become a mermaid, and now you can actually sail through the ocean, etc. But that's not where the innovation ends, because then they introduce new unique abilities for each one of those 
characters that you have and ranks that you can level them up in, which you do not by just defeating enemies, but by completing specific challenges. And then they do something even more interesting, which is cross-class abilities. So if you want to use an ability that maybe your rat had, but you want to use it on your ghost, you can now do that. And the game encourages you to try those by presenting challenges where you have to utilize a different character's abilities with the character that you're currently playing. And so all of this innovation leads to a wonderful amount of different kind of combinations and abilities that you can utilize, uh, constantly focusing on changing up your strategy so you never really get hold into one idea of how you're supposed to play the game. It really encourages you to try new things because of the way it's set up. A really interesting idea, really cool concept that plays very well. It does get a little bit tricky with the challenging nature of the dungeons, which is going to frustrate some, but I do have to give it a lot of credit for the amount of innovation that it does. Number three on my list is one I had forgotten I had even played, and then Alex brought it up in an episode of Total Pebble Knockdown, and I was like, oh right, I did play that, I'll go back and try it again, and I'm very glad that I did, because number three is Hard Space Shipbreaker. You know, the concept is so odd. It really is. You are playing basically a junkyard scrapper in space. Your whole deal is that you get these ships that come into your, your shipyard, and you have to break it down for parts. But they do such a wonderful job of starting to introduce different systems that have to be disposed of in specific ways. So you need to, like, shut down the fuel before you start taking apart the fuel lines or the thing's going to explode. You you have to take out all of the fuses before you take out the, like, energy core or you're going to have radiation leaks. Like, they start to do all of these things where you realize each one of these ships is a, basically a puzzle that you have to go around and uh, and figure out how you're going to break it down and get as much as you possibly can and get as many of the accolades as you possibly can for each one of those ships. The general framework of the story starts out as you're just like a billion and a half dollars in debt, and you need to pay off your debt to the company that you're working for. And then over the course of the game, it starts to become a lot more about corporate thinking and about trying to stop uh, both the individuals from doing what they want to do aspiring to something more, and also, like, shutting down unions. So it has really interesting talking points behind the scenes as well. But the gameplay itself, while on the surface seems pretty rudimentary, is actually very entertaining and ends up being a really unique puzzle game more than anything else. Number four is a return to a great series. It's Slime Rancher 2. I really enjoyed the first Slime Rancher, and I was looking forward to see what they did in the sequel. And I'm not going to lie, it's not a ton of new stuff. Some new slimes, some new abilities, and everything like that. But it's pretty much just Slime Rancher, with a 2 after it, and some, you know, graphical upgrades and such. Uh, Beatrix LeBeau returns to go off to the Rainbow Islands. Her time on the far, far range had prepared her for this. I did make a note that she does get stupid sequel brain and forgets a lot of things that she knew in the first game. But it is still endlessly enjoyable going around this very colorful world and sucking up your little slimes and trying to combine them into new and unique ways to farm their plorts and get money and upgrades from them. That's not to say that I couldn't see some real improvements in terms of the efficiency of the game, like having to manually, you know, vacuum out plorts or a vacuum in your fruits into the, the feeder tubes, etc., but minor inconveniences overall. With number five, we finally hit some Souls-likes, and uh, 
Some of them were very good this year, and some of them I didn't like very much. But number five is Steel Rising. Now, Spiders has a long history of making, like, their versions of popular game series. And Steel Rising is definitely their Dark Souls. I would actually say it's probably more their Bloodborne. But they do a really interesting job of creating this war-torn revolutionary era of France that happens to be currently populated by a lot of homicidal robots. You get to play this dancer automaton called Aegis, who is there to protect uh, Marie Antoinette. And so you get this very well-fleshed-out world and setting that tries to stay on theme. Something that I often find Souls Likes have trouble with is the idea of theming the world so that all of the bosses and creatures inside of it make contextual sense, Steel Rising doesn't seem to have that problem because the the machines have taken over. And so everything that you fight, everybody that you fight are these machines. And the bosses at the end of the stages are large versions in some ways of the machines that you've been fighting. The weapons are also themed to be more that like Victorian steampunk sort of aesthetic and the whole thing just works very well together. And I, I'm kind of surprised that people didn't talk about it more, just because I think that if you might get frustrated with Souls Likes, but you might like the idea of them, Steel Rising does a good job of not being so frustrating that you don't want to play it, but still be challenging enough that you will not find it boring. And I'm going to follow that up with another Souls-like title. Number six is Asterigo's Curse of the Stars. A title that is not like a, a major budget title, but to look at it would surprise you. Because it feels like there was a real budget and also that there was real polish on the game. It just looks spectacular. The very idea of playing Hilda going into this cursed city of Aphis and theming it around the ideas of, like, Greek or Roman mythology, and kind of creating the world in that way, is really neat and thematically works very well for this genre. But then the idea of being able to take two of any six of the base weapons that you have in the game and assigning them at the same time so that you can create new and interesting combinations is a really interesting mechanic. I also appreciated that Asterigos, out of the two of these games that I just talked about, is less a Souls-like than Steel Rising, in that your experience and your currency are separated out. You have a currency that you use to buy things, you have experience that you accrue over the course of time. If for some reason you do uh, die or get resurrected, transported back, in battle, you don't really lose anything from that experience. So that was a kind of a nice change of pace. Uh, but that is not to say that the bosses are not pretty difficult. Some of them definitely are and will tax you trying to figure out how you're going to address the situation. And there's also a fairly limited number of respawn points in the game. So backtracking is definitely going to become a thing. So, some really good points and some less than stellar points, but well worth your time if you like this genre and wanted to try one of those less well-known titles. Number seven is Bear and Breakfast. You know, the thing that the cozy game genre really needed more of were bears. And good news, Bear and Breakfast gives you exactly that. You get to play a bear. And the bear is very upset that humans have left his lovely, I don't remember what the world is called, but we'll say it's Jellystone National Park. And the thing is, he needs to now set up these bed and breakfasts so that he and his friends can finally get trash that the humans produce so that they can make stuff out of it. It's a really fun concept. I was a little surprised because at first I thought I was just going to create the one bed and breakfast, and that was all I was going to be doing. And then it turns out that there's actually many, many sites that have their own challenges associated with them. Uh, like when you get up into the mountains and it's very, very cold. And now you also have to keep an eye on 
uh, how hot the rooms are, you know, the, the temperature aspect of it. Uh, different facilities that different locations have. You have s'more stations that you need to set up at one of them, a bar that's at another one. And so there's uh, different challenges that come across to keep you on your toes and to create unique experiences as you open up these different areas. And also, like, it's got a quirky sense of humor to it. It's got a really great art style that I enjoyed very much. And being able to set up those individual rooms and try to figure out good combinations of how you're going to develop them is a welcome change of pace to the cozy game genre. The only thing I would have cited is that they could have done a, a better job at really explaining how the ins and outs of those facilities work. Like, if I need a dining room, do I need a dining room specifically for each and every room? Or is it just like I can create a dining room that will service X number of bedrooms? Which it turns out, you do. You really only need to service a specific area with one dining room, which it would be good to know at the outset. Number eight, Potion Craft. The only one of the three potion games this last year that is on this list because I just played the demos for Potionomics and Potion Permit. This is the one I actually played the full game of. Potion Craft, though, is unique in that it basically tasks you with the idea of creating potions based on ingredients that you get, but the ingredients are going to navigate around a map to get to the actual effects. So you have to think of the different herbs and mushrooms and crystals that you get as traversal tools for the map that you have to be on in order to get to the potion effects. And that's a really interesting concept. It, it's not what you expect, but it is very unique in the way it is presented. And then you get to create the potions. You might be able to save the recipes, buy the ability to save even more recipes, and then create them en masse with the right ingredients. And then you can go and sell them off to the people that are coming to your shop. See if you can haggle with them. Get the best price. Maybe buy new ingredients from passing salesmen. These uh, keep you engaged over the course of time, but they never make you feel limited in time frame. You always feel like you have more than ample time in order to do any of these things, and it doesn't really care how many days you spend in it before you achieve any of the goals. It's a nice game that makes you feel like you really are experimenting to try and figure out the best formula, the most efficient way to do a potion recipe. And while later on it can start to feel like a slog trying to get to the outer reaches of any of these potions, um, it's still a lot of fun the first time maybe you try it. Number 9, Tinykin, the spiritual successor to Pikmin. Boy, it's been a long time since I said the name of that game, and yet we finally have uh, a real successor to that franchise. Uh, once again, you are cast as being someone very, very small in a very large world, uh, but now you're in an actual house trying to traverse staircases and chairs, tables, etc. Uh, but also, they have streamlined a lot of the processes that you go through. Like in Pikmin, you had to manually figure out how to get your Pikmin up to different platforms and down from platforms, and in Tinykin, they simplify that to... You just need to get there, and your tiny kin that do various different kinds of tasks will just follow you, and you can recall them at any time. I think the streamlining is a good idea. It might eliminate some of the puzzle elements to the game that Pikmin reveled in, but at the same time, it kind of just moves the whole process along <laughs> a little faster. I also like the idea of the art style being like, 2D figures in a 3D world. Very unique. The environments are fun to traverse. They do a lot with the very mundane setting of a house, and they really expand out the idea of trying to traverse your bathroom or your kitchen or what have you uh, in new and unique ways since you are very, very small. 
And for anyone who liked the concept of Pikmin, where you get to control all these little guys and uh, make them go around and do different tasks for you, I think that you're going to be happy with uh, Tiny Kin. Number 10 is Coral Island. Now, full disclosure, I had previously backed Coral Island on Kickstarter when it was first announced, uh, so I probably have a bias here. And it is indeed still early access, which is pretty obvious when you start playing the game. There are a lot of missing components that you can tell they are adding in later. But that doesn't really stop the fact that they still take the idea of Stardew Valley, and they try to create a much more realistic art style, like full 3D art style and feel to that game. And as many people know, Stardew Valley is one of my favorite games of all time. And I think Coral Island is a wonderful tribute to that while creating a lot more characters, a lot more design options, character design options, more things to do, an expansion of the genre. I also liked the idea of dredging the oceans and clearing up the trash in the ocean floor and finding out that there's mermaids under the ocean and all of these neat, unique things that they try to add in as additional stuff that you didn't really do in Stardew Valley. Uh, it's got a long way to go, but I did really appreciate what's there already. Okay, the next game is one that I insisted on playing before I made this list. It's the reason why it took me this long to make it. Uh, and since it's at 11, you might know that that might not have necessarily been worth it. But still, Plague Tale Requiem is a return to form to people who really enjoyed Innocence. And Innocence was very, very good. I think Requiem doesn't do as much new and innovative stuff as Innocence really did. And Innocence was much more of a stealth action game, where you really, really had to think about the actions that you were going to take. Requiem makes it much clearer that it is supposed to be an action-oriented game. Uh, Amicia in this one is taking a much more direct approach. There are some fight scenes where she is just sling whipping enemy after enemy as they just come at her onslaught they make it much clearer that there are options to take out your opponents and do it in a more direct way than they did in innocence the story also takes off directly after amicia and hugo's first adventure and the plague has returned and Hugo is in danger again, so there's a little bit of repetition there. But it doesn't stop the fact that the storyline, the characters, the narrative, the, the way the game presents itself, is very intriguing and interesting. I just don't consider it nearly as innovative or as good as the first title. Number 12 is Disney Dreamlight Valley. Uh, yes, there's going to be a lot of cozy games on this, a lot of the farm management sims. I'm sorry, it's just something I enjoy. But I was really surprised by Dreamlight Valley, only because when I see Disney is creating a game, my initial thought is, oh, that's probably going to be a cash grab. And while there are aspects to that in Dreamlight Valley, I was kind of surprised by the fact that they did a pretty good job with the overall farm sim, life sim elements of the game. Being able to go into individual Disney worlds and find the characters from your favorite Disney movies and then create houses for them to live in Dreamlight Valley itself while opening up all of these other new and interesting sections of the world and uncovering the story about like why uh, this, this world is under attack is uh, a really interesting one. It's bright and colorful and has a ton of well-rendered characters that all seem to work well in this game, even though they're from very disparate movies. Also, from a technical aspect, I liked that all of your tools, like your pickaxe or your shovel, are on just like a, a tool scroll wheel. They're not in your inventory itself. Good call there. 
But it's also not as deep as some of the other life sims. Uh, it feels very simplistic by its nature when you're trying to do farming or you're trying to do fishing, anything like that. So it's got some trade-offs, but surprisingly good considering it's coming from a giant corporation. Number 13 is... Um, did I read that right? Yeah, apparently Trombone Champ is number 13. Really? Okay. Yeah, I can't tell you that I spent a lot of time with Trombone Champ because, frankly, it doesn't take you all that long to unlock all of the cards in the game and play most of the songs at least once. But it is kind of hilarious uh, just realizing that trombones are horribly underutilized in terms of musical compositions and trying to figure out how to play them well. Now, you can do the whole thing with basically a mouse, and you're probably better off to play it with a mouse, uh, but you will find it kind of hilarious, especially when you get to later levels, just how insane the songs get, to the point where I, I don't know how people actually do it. They, they would have to practice this for a very long time. And I guess at the end of the day, I thought that it was funny. It has some really neat humor that is trombone-related. Think about that for a second. But it also doesn't have a ton of content where it would be higher up on this list. I know that there's a lot of things apparently you can unlock, but I have absolutely no idea how to do it, and I don't know what the mechanism is to do so, or why I would want to. But it is pretty darn funny while you are playing it, and that's worth something. However, if you're looking for something that you can enjoy that's very funny, that's also free, number 14 is a game called The Looker. Uh, if you have not played The Witness, a lot of this is going to go over your head, but The Witness was a puzzle adventure game that you went around trying to connect uh, your lines from start to finish. And so The Looker is a free game that was made as sort of a parody of that. It's not particularly long. It's not deep. It's got some really stupid bathroom humor in it. It's also got some really well-done parody. But I do remind you, it is free, and it will occupy a good hour and a half of your time. So right there, great installment. A lot of people may see some overlap between the Metroidvania style of game and the Soulsborne style of game. And nowhere did I see that more than in Ghost Song, which is a 2D action platformer that feels like it's in the style of Metroid, but then has some soulsy elements to it, like, you know, having some tactical boss battles where you will drop all of your currency of sorts, regenerating enemies every time you save the game, and stuff to that nature. The almost watercolor art style, though, that they put in just kind of creates something very unique in the experience. And I did feel like it did a smart thing of having more of the Metroidvania kind of exploration elements that make it more tolerable than really hardcore Souls-like games do. At a certain point, though, the big problem rears its ugly head. Traversal. There's not a ton of points that you can use as fast travel. More importantly than that, it gets to be very tricky to figure out where you're even supposed to go, and it starts to become a lot of backtracking that you don't even know if it's worth backtracking to because you're not sure where you're actually headed to. Uh, this is where the game ends up losing me, and that's unfortunate because the overall look and style of the game were really nice. Roguelikes are a difficult genre for me, and I can usually either take them or leave them. A Dreamscaper was very good when I started playing it, and ended up being kind of a slog by the end, and that's why it's at number 16. So the idea of going from the waking world to the dream world, and the dream world is like fighting your inner demons and everything, it's a, it's a neat concept, uh, where you get to have all these kind of weird weapons that you get to play around with. You, you might have Super Saiyan sort of fists all the way to like basic nunchucks and some really out there ones. 
And then you take what you learned while you were playing in the dream world and the currency that you accrue, you can use in the waking world to get inspiration that allows you to get new options when you go back into the dream world. So that theoretically, you're going to be able to get further and further every time you play. There is one big problem that I see with this, though, and that's that it's it's broken up into individual chapters. But if you die at any point, you're going to have to go back to the very beginning of that. So you got to go back and beat all of the bosses over and over again. Now, this is something that a lot of roguelikes do, and it's one of the things I don't really enjoy. I really wish that there were some options so that I could bypass the earlier stages after I had already completed them. Maybe they could be one of those things that I unlock, right? Like, maybe I could skip chapter one if I've accrued enough of the correct kind of currency in the waking world that I can instantly recall, like, chapter one and start from chapter two and then chapter three. That would prevent me from having to go through a lot of, of slog in order to get to the next big set piece, but they don't do that. Number 17 is a game that I actually had on my 2020 list as well, but now it's in the full release version, so it's Grounded. Uh, Grounded is kind of brutal as far as survival games go, but the idea of doing the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids style action game is really interesting and fun. Of course, then you start playing the game and you realize that it is also just going to kill you over and over and over again. Boy, those spiders, they hate you. But it's worse now, because now there's also a giant fish and mosquitoes. There's everything and its brother that wants to kill you. They've put just so much stuff in the game, and, and it all hates you. At least there's more content now. But it's hard to engage with it when the game, even on easy difficulties, are so painstakingly difficult. I think it's because they wanted to encourage four-player co-op. But frankly, what if I just want to play by myself, folks? I'm going to get stuck very easily, and I did, on multiple occasions where there was just nowhere for me to go. And since there's survival mechanics of needing to eat and drink, you can't just stay stationary in the game. You have to go out and forage. Just to get killed immediately the second that you step outside of your hovel, because there's both a spider and a mosquito that are trying to kill you from two different angles. This happens multiple times. And then you respawn exactly where you were when you died. Good times. So 18 is Death Stranding Director's Cut, which needs to get real props for what it's trying to achieve. Hideo Kojima is a, a, a genius in the video game industry, and I think that sometimes that works to his benefit, and sometimes it works to his detriment, because sometimes genius isn't really understood by people, mainly me. Uh, Death Stranding is a game where your primary mechanic is being able to traverse the world so that you can deliver packages. You can trip on little tiny rocks, and if you weigh yourself down enough, you might even trip when you try to make a slight turn to the left or to the right. This is all muddled by the sequences where you have to basically cover your breath because there are shadow creatures in the sky that are constantly looming over you and want to attack you. There's a lot of different elements to this game that work well independently of each other. There are some combat mechanics. There's the part where you get to ride on a motorcycle, which is a big improvement to traversal. There's the actual traversal elements of the landscape itself. But when you try to put them all together, it feels like such a mishmash of ideas. Unfortunately, it just doesn't engage in the way that I was hoping it was going to. It seems almost too quirky for my liking. And then, just to kind of top it all off, in this post-apocalyptic world where I'm trying to rediscover the world and, and build it back, there's like monster energy drinks and ads for an AMC show. Tonally, it's just all over the place. <laughs> It is Kojima, so, I mean, maybe we should expect that, but still, it's, it, it lost me. <laughs>
it lost me. Speaking of losing you, 19, high on life. Uh, you know, the thing about it is, uh, Justin Roiland aside, Squanchy Games did make a, a surprisingly polished experience for a shooter. I do want to give him credit for that, but it's also pretty much just a shooter outside of the Rick and Morty sort of flair and attitude. Outside of the personality that it pursues, it doesn't really do a ton of unique stuff. I mean, you're like a bounty hunter, which is kind of a neat idea because if you remember, the original concept for Prey 2 was just that. However, and I'm not going to mince words, you really have to make the guns not talk so much. Like the, like, the idea of the talking living guns is a unique concept, but they are kind of annoying. They talk constantly, and you do even have sliders in the game to turn that down. One of the things that's kind of annoying, though, from a technical aspect, is that in the worlds that you go to for these bounties, they uh, feel both linear and also very difficult to traverse. I found myself going through these worlds not knowing exactly where I'm supposed to go, even though it feels like a pretty linear path. Like, like imagine going through a corridor, right? Uh, but then you get to the end of a corridor, and it doesn't look like there's anywhere to go from the corridor. It looks like there's some grappling points for the mushrooms so they can get up on those. But wait, none of those go to the mushroom I need to get to. Okay, I'm in a facility. I got to the end of a door. It's, this is apparently where my map marker is for the door. How do I get through the door? I can't get through the door now. Wh do, I, do I have to access something? Where is it? It's, it's surprising because the look of the game is very impressive. Like, the graphics are very impressive. The attitude of the game is pretty interesting and intriguing. But then you get to actually play the game. And, and, and the game tries to work against itself at every possible moment. And if it's going to work against itself, why am I trying to make up for it with my gamer brain to make the game work? Number 20 is Let's Build a Zoo, a game where you build a zoo. You can also do genetics experiments in this to uh, mix like a chinchilla with a duck or something. So that's kind of fun. The idea of the game is that every day you have to get people into the park and have them spend money at your concession stands, etc. Some of the mechanics, though, just don't make any sense. Like, one time as an experiment, I set my ticket price to free, and I still had people complain about the price. It's also very tricky to figure out how to get enough people into your park, because it all has to revolve around the buses, and you can buy a bunch of buses, but they only have the one entry in order to get into the park. So by the end of the day, you still have like 25 buses backed up. And I will also make one other really important point. Don't play it on console. Because the console controls in order to make your zoo are absolutely abstract in the way that they present themselves. You need a mouse to click on the buttons. Does not work on console. Not from a user interface aspect at least. But you can make an ostrich snake. So there's that. Number 21 on my list is, uh, to some people's minds, going to still be far too high to rank this, but it's Saints Row. So when the new Saints Row was announced, there was a lot of negative press around it because it didn't have any of the original cast. They were going to reboot the entire series, and I can understand that that might be a problem for some because, let's face it, the original series was just absolutely insane fun. The new one takes more of a realistic approach, I mean realistic in terms of Saints Row, uh, of these kids that are disenfranchised with the gangs and organizations that they are currently involved in and decide to make their own gang. And then they call it the Saints. Build their little empire out of a church. And you might be like, oh, great, Gen Z Saints Row. And from the outset, that's exactly what it is. But I didn't mind the way that the story was presenting itself, and more importantly, it did at least do some unique things in trying to build up your empire by creating different businesses and having those businesses inform the mini-games that you were going to do. So you open up your clinic, and then you can do the insurance fraud mini-games. 
But yeah, I mean, it still has a lot of problems associated with it. Like, for instance, the enemies are damage sponges. A lot of them have shields that keep you from doing basic takedown maneuvers. It just drags the whole experience down. It's not nearly as memorable or interesting as other Saints Row games. If you're going to compare it to that, you are definitely going to find this game coming up short. But just taken on its own merits, it's a relatively enjoyable open world adventure game that's going to remind you of other open world adventure games. Number 22 is a game that chances are you have not heard of. It's called Ayudin Chronicle Rising. Basically think of a 2D platformer that's also an RPG. I don't really know how much I have to say about this. Uh, you do a lot of action sequences that are going to remind you of a Metroid sort of title, but in a much more linear fashion. And then you get experience for that that upgrades your character. Then you can go back to your town, you can get a lot of upgrades for your character, and you get stamps that allow you to unlock the next chapter of the game. Uh, it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but I can't really tell you that it's good, and that's unfortunate because I, I thought that the idea behind the game and the way that it was presented was kind of neat, but it really does want you to backtrack through the same locations over and over and over again in order to uncover the next thing or a new area that you previously couldn't unlock. And it sort of does that by not a natural style like you would have seen in Metroid where you're like, oh, I got to go back to that place later on where the player wants to do it, but because the missions tell you you have to do it. And I feel like that's just forcing the narrative on people more than the player being engaged to actually go back to those areas and uncover things that they previously couldn't. The game just tells you this is the next mission and, oh, you can go back to that area before. Less exploration and more dictating where you're going to go. Number 23, this one hurts me, uh, is uh, Weird West. Because I had a lot of big hopes for Weird West. It was going to be an immersive sim, but in like a top D, almost CRPG fashion that took place in the West, but was also going to have supernatural elements to it. And I can tell you that it does indeed do all those things. The problem is, is that it's not very fun to play. The control scheme seems to work against you at every possible turn. There were Plenty of times where the game just wanted to make it as complicated as humanly possible to, like, fire a gun or, or throw an explosive into a room. It never felt satisfying to play. The, the controls and the user interface and everything just always felt unsatisfying in my hands. Like, I, I would never feel comfortable playing the game because of how they had set the whole thing up. That's a real shame because the idea behind it is so neat, but I couldn't even get through the first character's chapter. And, and I know that there's like three other characters that you play where you get to try different skill sets and abilities and, and ways to address situations, but I lost interest in the game before I had completed the first character story arc. And I wanted to like this game. Speaking of wanting to like a game, 24, Trek to Yomi. I want to give Trek to Yomi all the props in the world for looking like a Kurosawa film that you play. It does that brilliantly. It is a black and white samurai adventure game that has the art style and even the cutscenes that really lend itself to a tale of revenge in, in like feudal Japan. And, and it looks great. It plays terribly. And it's not even that the controls aren't responsive. It's that it's so boring. It's so boring. Here's what you do in Trek to Yomi. You approach an enemy. You swing your sword. The enemy dies. You go up to the next enemy. I swing my sword. The enemy dies. Oh, oh, there's an enemy really far away. I throw a kunai at him. He dies. I get to the next arena. Oh, the guy has a sword. He's coming at me. Oh, before he hits me, I gotta, I gotta hit low. 
and he and and he dies. It's pretty linear. There aren't a lot of alternate paths or you know out of the way exploration elements. It's in a chapter by chapter framework, uh, so it's not like Metroidvania style where I might be able to like explore the landscape. It, it pretty much wants me to go through this path, uh, chapter by chapter, to go through the storyline. And pretty much just do the thing where I swing my sword. And I don't know. I just found it to be incredibly boring. To the point that the style points that it gets just could not outweigh it. Number 25 I'm probably going to catch flack for because it's Tunic. Um, while I can appreciate the idea of doing kind of a Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening style game with a fox. That's actually more of a Souls-like game. I felt... Tunic was far too frustrating a title for me to enjoy, and I did try a couple times to play it. It's a very difficult game, and when I think about difficulty like this, it doesn't really lend itself to the Link's Awakening style of graphics and framework that the game usually presents itself as. And so this is where Tunic ends up losing me. Uh, I did like the concept of being able to uncover the manual of the game by figuring out the language, the mythical language, over the course of the game. And while that's cool, it doesn't make the game better to play. A game can have a cool concept, but if not implemented in an interesting way to enhance the game experience, I just note it. And then move on. Okay, we're getting toward the bottom here. This is not going to be good. Um, 26 is Thymesia. Yeah, you know how I talked about a couple really good Souls-likes that I played this year? This ain't one of them, Chief. Because Thymesia is trying desperately to just be Dark Souls and failing. From the get-go, it just gives you so much text to read about how you're supposed to play the game. And then, just tries to do as many of the dodges and the rolls and the counter maneuvers and the parries that you could possibly squeeze into the first, like, 10 or 20 minutes of the game. You go to these very brown environments, a lot of them just corridor streets that veer off in a couple different directions, with enemies that are just around every corner, and they spring out at you in true Souls-like fashion. Like, I guess technically it functions properly, but there's not a lot to it. Like, besides the idea of being able to be like a plague doctor, or at least have a plague doctor mask on, which is something neat, the game doesn't really offer anything interesting, or even a particularly good Souls-like experience from the get-go. And with games that came out the same year, like the Steel Rising and Asterigos that I mentioned before, I don't know why you would bother playing this. It's very derivative. 27. You suck at parking. It sucks as a game. The idea is that you have to park your car in a parking space, in a time frame, without running out of gas. It's kind of like a puzzle game, I suppose. But there is no reverse on your cars. I suppose that would probably make it a little too easy. But it gets pretty frustrating pretty quickly as it starts implementing, like, laser grids and magnets and wind machines and mines and everything to the point where you're like, I, why do I care about parking my car this much? I really don't. Number 28 is Submerged Hidden Depths, which I tried playing on stream and then realized is somehow even more boring than the first Submerged game. This one does add in more puzzle elements, so it's not just the traversing the tower sort of gameplay that you saw in the first one, but the puzzles are very rudimentary, uh, and they are still somehow very confusing uh, as you get to them. So you're going to just spend a lot of time, instead of traversing the buildings, trying to figure out what you're going to do with this orb that you're carrying, and then realize, oh, I gotta send it down this chute, figure out where the chute is, then put it down that chute, and then go and grab it somewhere else by traversing the tower yet again, downward. It's just like an excuse to traverse the tower more. It's, it's a boring game. It looks great. 
don't get me wrong, like, I think that the, like, graphical nature of the Submerged series is its highlight. And I like the wordless storytelling aspect to it. But wow, can they make a submerged post-apocalyptic ancient civilization boring. Number 29. What you all came here for. Diablo Immortal, everybody. Yep, we finally got to it. It's Diablo Immortal. It's not the bottom, but it's close to it. Diablo Immortal is not uh, good. It's not good. It looks okay. I'll give it props for that. But it is definitely a mobile game that they then said, oh, I guess we'll port it to the PC because everybody was like, uh, maybe we don't have a phone. All of your abilities automatically unlock, and you seem to unlock them so quickly that I didn't even know what the leveling up system meant. Like, I think I leveled up about seven times in the first 15 minutes of the game. And I, I even had trouble keeping track of what exactly I was getting for those levels. You don't have a lot of personal input in how you're developing your characters to begin with. Most of your abilities are automatically assigned, and so your necromancer, when you play your necromancer, is going to be 90% the same build as another necromancer. And everybody's playing in the same space. There's whole things in Immortal where you just have a, like auto-run to your next location. They've pretty much created a game where you have to have as little input as possible in actually playing the Diablo game. And I don't know about you, but usually when I sit down to play Diablo, I'd like to actually play the game and this seems more interested in trying to sell me microtransactions. If Diablo 4 is anything like this, I'm going to be a very, very sad panda. What could be worse than Diablo Immortal? Well, there's two more games on this list, so we'll find out. Number 30 is Shredders. Shredders is a snowboarding game, I guess. It uses some of the absolute worst voiceover and cutscenes that I have ever seen in a game, and the most rudimentary, bare bones, very sad gameplay. It also features one of the most hideous user interfaces I've seen. I keep thinking back to like SSX, like the rebooted SSX, or even the original series SSX, and they did so much more and such more interesting stuff than Shredders will ever do, and it played better. I don't know why this game exists. I literally don't know why this game exists, but it is really unfortunate. So many better games that are in the extreme sports genre, and this is not even close to hitting the polish of those games. And finally, number 31, a game which maybe one day... I'll go back and look at and realize I was wrong about it, but I've tried playing it a couple times now, and I just, I can't, it's Little Witch in the Woods. It's Little Witch in the Woods. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, this is a genre, I should have loved this game. I really should have loved Little Witch in the Woods. Why? It, it's, it's like a cozy game. It's, it's a life sim. You're, you're supposed to be this little witch in, in the woods. It's right there in the title. And you're supposed to go and start, like, making potions and stuff? Oh, it's a potion game, too, apparently. It's so painfully slow. It's so... It's mind-numbingly slow. Like, I, I don't even know how many ways I can explain how slow it is. The storyline is slow. When you're on the train at the very beginning of the game, you're talking to these characters, and the talking... The, the conversations, the exposition at the beginning of the game is so incredibly slow. And then you get off the train, and you start walking through the forest, and your walking speed, even when you go to run, even when you use stamina to run, is slow. So slow, it takes you like a minute to get through one screen if you just beeline it all the way from the bottom to the top of the screen. It still takes you like a full minute to get there. You walk so incredibly slow. And I, I would have said that it was a problem with the game, because then I tried playing it on PC, and it looks like you go a little bit faster. But then, 
then that that whole thing just goes right out the window because then you get to a cutscene and all of a sudden you can move really quickly. How'd that happen? I don't know. Then I got soft locked real quickly because they ask you to do in a cutscene uh, something that requires stamina, and I had used up all my stamina trying to move at a somewhat brisk pace so that it didn't feel like it took me an hour to get through the damn forest to start. So then I had to like restart the game. And then eventually you get to the cabin and you go to sleep and they say, no, you can't sleep now. You have to go and clean out cobwebs. So then I got to spend time cleaning out the cobwebs around the alchemy lab. And after every one of the cobwebs gets cleared, there's an exposition part where we have to explain stuff in giant walls of text. And then I slowly walk over to the other, to, to the other cobweb so I can have another scene of explaining stuff that isn't even revolving around the cobwebs. It took, it just, it, 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 so, if I had a table readily available, I would have smashed my head into the table playing this game. It's mind-numbingly slow, and I don't understand, I can't understand why, why, why did you do that game? I understand it was in game preview, maybe they fixed this later, but why would you ever introduce the game in that state where it's so frustratingly slow? It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Never release your game in a state that people will fall asleep or want to smash their head into a wall from boredom before they even get to the witch part or the woods part. Don't, don't, don't do that, folks. It's going to land you at the bottom of this list. And it did. I don't want to hear about in a year or two when I can move the little witch in the woods at three times the speed, finally. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Okay, well, once again, we have completed a list of every game that I played from the year, ranked best to worst, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly hope I didn't forget any games. If they did, they apparently weren't very interesting or good. And so I'm just going to say that. Um, hopefully at some point I will do a bigger thing about Pentiment when I get a chance to play that. And hopefully I will get to play full versions of some of those demos that I was talking about. And if so, we'll do some episodes on that. But until that time, thank you for joining me here on the Citanium Mine. And uh, I hope that you have uh, an easy time getting out of here. The minecart is still broken. Um, and I have no plans on fixing it. And uh, let me get, get you a parting gift. It is uh, a Snuggie from about 20 years ago. Oh. You've... You've left already. Okay, well, the Snuggie's mine, then. Can't stop me. <laughs>